Our second scripture reading comes from Galatians 6, it's Galatians 6, chapters 1 through 16. My friends, if anyone is detect detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing, they are something. They deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause of pride. For all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the spirit, you will reap eternal life from the spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right. For we will reap at harvest if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. See what large letters I make when I am writing in my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh that try to compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not per persecute for the cause of Christ. Even the circumcised do not themselves obey the law, but they want to be circumcised so that, may, so that they may not boast about your own flesh. May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and, to, and I to the world. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. As for those who will follow through this rule, peace be, up, be upon them, and mercy and upon the Israel of God. So first off, let me say thank you. Thank you for the welcome that you have already given me. Thank you for taking the risk um, that is our polity and taking a chance with me coming in. And thank you, Steve and SPRC, for all of your work and helping guide this transition. Um, and thank you, Bill, for all of the help and getting to know um, folks even before this day. Thank you. Um, for the witness that you have already shared and for who you are and the commitments and work that you have already done here. And, and that's in general, despite the literal work that just happened this past week. And thank you for that, too. Twitter was awesome. There was lots of singing going on of, of all the good stuff that was happening. So thank you. Um, I thought that in our first couple of months here during the summer, since we are getting to know one another, that we can um, center that in Scripture. Um, and so instead of the typical Hebrew Bible reading and gospel passage, I thought that we'd take from the lectionary the psalm and the epistle so we can have the collective prayers of our foremothers and forefathers um, as they gathered and worship and journeyed in this faith life together. Um, and then also the epistles, so those writings um, and trying to figure out who the church was when it was first getting started um, so that we can center our own conversations and those conversations and do this journey together. Um, so when we look to the Psalms, um, we look at prayers that go through all of life. When we're in those moments where everything is clicked together and set and organized well and we're chugging right along, in those moments of deep disorientation when something as life inevitably brings our way comes and, and breaks all apart, um, that pace and that rhythm and that understanding um, that we were working from. But then there's also that new orientation that comes, right? When having worked through all of that disruption and all of that chaos, and life settles a little bit once again. And that's where we find ourselves with Psalm 30, that sweet relief of having made it through the night and feeling the joy and the sun's first warming rays, knowing that it's going to be okay. Now, that's where the psalmist is today, and I know that all of us are not in that place right now, um, but together we're going to figure this out um, as we go along. Um, one of the things um, that I love about being faith and church together um, is that we are able to sing and to pray for one another 
when the other is in a spot where they just can't muster the words. And once that dawn comes for them, they'll be able to sing and pray the words that maybe we can't at that moment. And that's why we go this way together, because we need each other, because life is going to happen differently at different times. And we can be the witness of faith that each other needs right at that moment. As I was trying to figure out back in high school um, what faith meant to me and what I wanted to do with my life and how I wanted um, all of this to come together, I still remember the chair I was sitting in in my parents' living room where, um, is anyone here in, or have been or going into chemistry um, Calculus, anybody? Yeah, is it coming? Yeah, this was 45 minutes on one chem problem, and I just couldn't get it. It wasn't coming. And I looked at the book, and this is when I had told my counselor that I was going to be pre-med. Um, and I was like, this is draining the lifeblood out of me, and I'm in high school. I haven't even gotten to college. Forget med school. This is not going to work. <laughs> it's just not. Um, so I finished the chem homework for that night, but then I was in the library the next day and wanted to say, like, I can't do this. But I knew if I went to the guidance counselor and said that, then I'd immediately be interrogated as to what I was going to do instead. Um, and so I sat down and wrote a list wherever I felt happiest and most alive. Um, and on the top of that list was counseling for church camp. Um, so I have, I'm a church camp um, child, um, 16 years straight in the West Ohio Conference, um, from camper to counselor. Um, and that's where I felt the most alive, especially as a counselor, in terms of feeling the most emptied and every single bit of me used, but then also the most excited. Because I, I would always remember the end of summer and the exhaustion that said, in and being like, okay, that's it. That's the last time. I, there's no way I can do this again. And then not even a few months later, the applications have rolled out and I'm like, yeah, camp. Um, and so that level of emptying and filling um, was what was at the top of the list. But then I had also just given a speech um, in um, English class on a project and had loved it and watched some of my friends queasy and nervous and struggling. I was like, oh, okay, so that's a different thing. And then lastly, um, I was a floater in high school, didn't really belong to any particular group. And so a lot of different people would come to me and ask advice. And it's high school, so it's all dating. Um, and I never dated in high school, but yet they'd still come. And we'd talk, and we'd sort it through, and it'd work well. Um, so, And there were a couple other things that I don't remember now. But as I was looking over that list, I just had this phenomenal click of peace inside. And looked at it, and was like, that's ministry. Um, very much raised in the church. Um, many people think my dad is a pastor himself. He's that committed. Um, he's not. He's a lawyer, um, which is just fun, right? Um, but never once had I been asked, like, you should think about this. Never once had I considered, you know, the pastor that's up there every Sunday morning as an actual gig. Um, but that moment was that. Um, and so I don't have a call story where there's lots of wrestling and I'm saying no, 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 and dragging, kicking, and screaming. Um, it was a very simple process for me. Um, but where the struggle came is when I um, spent a year abroad, my junior year of college, in Ecuador. And that's where I was afraid of my call. Um, because I was at churches there and for the very first time, saw the power of religion and of faith um, used to create harm. Um, and that was on a personal level in the church and the way that the pastor was preaching. Um, and that was also on a collective level. And I was in an indigenous thought class and in my research found a contract between the Ecuadorian government and North American missionaries removing a tribe from the Amazon to a reservation so that the government could drill the land for oil and the missionaries could have them in one place to evangelize to. Um, and so navigating that and the divide between Catholics and Protestants that I found there was a really profound experience for me that rocked everything I knew and scared me. 
of what could happen from the power of religion. And so I like the Psalms because they help me, they give me a way to process all of that so that I can be honest about the power that I find, whether it's harmful or wonderful, empowering power that brings wholeness um, and that, that good, good biblical covenant word of shalom or not. And so that's why I am so excited to spend this time centering in prayers um, that help me give up a little bit of my obsession with Western linear progression. Uh, things need to step in and, the, and we need to keep going so that we don't regress. Um, but that lets life be life and moments be moments where we will live into our best self sometimes and not be able to at other times. Um, and then there will be things done to us or things that we encounter that take our worlds apart. But there are this incredibly, incredibly gifted community of saints, of foremothers and forefathers who have walked this road, who know that cycle of orientation and disorientation and new orientation and the anxiety that it causes, but pave a way of faith for us to move through that together so that nothing that we encounter in life is wasted. And that's what I want to talk about and promise to you today, that as we go this way together, as this psalm that we read said, there will be dark nights and there will be joyous mornings. There will be both because that's the way that life is. But I promise to walk with you, and I promise that we serve a God who will not waste one bit of that, but will use all of that to do what only God can do and bring forth life in ways we never could imagine it. So as we go this way, and as we hit those moments of being afraid or concerned or anxious, I want us to take Paul's epistle to um, heart and be gentle with each other. And in that, come to me and tell me. Like, I work best with honest, direct communication. And we're all new at this. And we don't, well, in terms of it being together. And we don't know each other. And so I'm not going to know necessarily when I've hit up against a sacred moment moment or tradition for you all or a way that you approach and understand God at work. So if there's anything that is of concern or that is unsettling or that you just don't know how to figure out or wrap your mind around, come and talk to me because I want to have that conversation because those are the moments in which we're going to be able to get to know each other and come to respect, if not love, the truth each of us brings to this journey. And I want those sacred moments with you. Um, so come and share that with me. Um, and as we talk about the logistics of that coming and sharing, um, I will just let you know that I try to work with um, the philosophy of working two-thirds out of the three-thirds of a day. So if we have late-night meetings, then I probably will come in a little bit later because I just got married a couple years ago, and I really like this one, and I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so I am fully committed to you, but I'm also fully committed to the promises I made to him. Um, so we'll, we'll balance that and bring that all together and work that together. Um, and I want you all to do the same with your family units um, as well. Um, so uh, lastly, one more quirk to share. Um, I already shared the barefoot moment and know that this is the opposite. I know that for some uh, parishioners that I've had, they've had a lot of trouble with the bare feet because feel that it is a tremendous disrespect to God in the pulpit. Know that that is not my intent. That is it. It is absolutely the opposite because I want to be rooted and grounded um, in this God moment. Um, the other quirk that I bring is that I very much personally in my own faith um, see God as both male and female. And there are moments that I need a father God and there are moments that I need a mother God. And so just a heads up, 
Both of those come out from time to time. Um, and I will give you another heads up that for Holy Spirit, I don't know if it's just the way that I've been raised and our values here with nurturing and those associations, but she's always been female um, for me. Um, so I just invite you that that's a bit of my faith and theology that I bring and would love to talk more about that with you or process that with you. But this is a little bit of who I am. Um, as, we, as we go this road together, as we figure one another out, um, we're going to come to bumps. Um, for this church that Paul was writing to, it was the circumcision, uncircumcision, and the leaders who espouse different traditions, and we've got a whole mess of that delightful Pauline lawyer language that gets really tangled, right, in Scripture. Um, but just know that the most important thing um, which Paul was calling us, um, the other leaders out on, is that whatever we do, we do so with a willingness to encounter both the suffering and the joy. So that whatever is important to us, um, may it be guided by what is most important, that everything is a new creation that we are called to be are citizens of God's kingdom. And as United Methodists, that means making disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. So Epworth, I'm ready to shine my light with you. I'm ready and excited to find what light that you are already shining. And I want to see and to know how Jesus will shine through all of us together so that nothing in our life is wasted, and so that our entire community gets curious enough about all the fantastic, amazing things that are going on here, that there are others who want to join us in our work. May we be Easter people, people who give witness to the hope that is ours, that the impossible is made possible, and the resurrection and the love and the hope of Jesus Christ. Amen.